Good morning, everybody. I'm glad you decided to join us here for Finley United's worship service online. And I hope you have a great time together as you worship with your family. I know that God's going to receive your praise and He's going to have something special for you. We'll begin that here in just a few moments, but there are a few things that we wanted to share with you before we get that service started. First of all, we want to remember this week uh, what it really means as we lead up to next Sunday, which is our Easter Sunday. But this is the week that is the passion of our Christ, the love of our God played out just like he had planned from the very beginning. And so as you go through your week, I challenge you to maybe take time to go back and read that story and realize all that God has done. And he's done that for you and he's done that for me. And so we'll even begin worshiping him for that very thing today. And so I pray that God blesses you in that. Let's be mindful of that as we go throughout our week. And throughout our week, some of the things that we're going to be doing is offering content every day on our Facebook page and also on our Finley Family uh, Facebook page, which is a closed group. But you can be there if you are a member. Just apply if you haven't done that already. But much of the content is still the same. We'll have things like our evening prayer time and devotion. You'll see those on Monday, Tuesday, Thursday, and Friday. On Wednesday, we have our Bible study. And then you can also look forward to the Family Five on Friday. Just different things throughout the week to help keep you connected uh, to each other and then to our God that we serve. And so let's uh, be looking forward to those things. As always, you can go to the app, leave your prayer request, and then be praying for others that leave those requests as well. And anything that you, any kind of communication you need to have with leadership there, you can do that online by sending a message. But there's a lot going on, even though we're not joining together to meet. God is still with us, and I'm thankful for that. He still inhabits the praises of His people. So in the next few minutes, as you and your family, those that are gathered with you, watch the service, participate, let's worship Him for what we celebrate this coming week and this coming Sunday, the fact that we have a risen Savior. That risen Savior is going to meet you here today in a few moments as you worship and praise Him. So in a couple of minutes, we'll get started. Thanks and God bless you all. Welcome to worship. Psalm 95 describes well the God that we will praise and worship this morning. O come, let us sing unto the Lord. Let us make a joyful noise to the rock of our salvation. Let us come before His presence with thanksgiving and make a joyful noise unto Him with psalms. For the Lord is a great God and a great King above all gods. In His hand are the deep places of the earth. The strength of the hills is his also. The sea is his, and he made it, and his hands form the dry land. O oh, come, let us worship and bow down. Let us kneel before the Lord our Maker, for he is our God, and we are the people of his pasture and the sheep 
of his hand. Let's worship that great God together as we sing.
For God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son, that whosoever believeth in Him should not perish, but have everlasting life. Now, you know that comes from John chapter 3, verse 16, probably the most quoted verse in all of the Bible. And here, in this last week of Jesus' life, it would have significance and meaning beyond just us quoting occasionally as we read or study or ponder God's goodness and love for us. And so this, this morning, if we could stop time and grab the earth by the handles and roll it back 2,000 years and wind up in that last week of Jesus' life, the one who so loved the world that he came, as Paul would write in 1 Timothy chapter 3, verse 16, God was manifest in the flesh or God made himself visible in the flesh. The one who loved the world, where would we find him that last week of his life on earth? Surely he would be in the large city or he'd be out where the masses are gathered and he'd be talking to as many people as he could, trying to convince them of their need to accept him and try to get to know them and let them see him and touch him and feel him and understand him before the coming weekend when he would be crucified. But instead, you find Jesus this last week of his life in very similar situation um, like you've been the last couple of weeks. He was with a few friends gathered in the home of Lazarus. And later on that same week, he would be having supper in the home of, of Simon the leper. Here, this one who loved the whole world so much that he came to die for the whole world, when he has just a few days left on the earth, he's spending that time quietly with those who are closest to him. This life of Jesus is extremely interesting. You go back to the beginning in, in Bethlehem when he was first born. That first night he spent in a stable, a borrowed stable, because there wasn't anybody inviting him, Mary or Joseph, to come and spend the night with them. And there was no room for them in the inn. And so that first night of his life on earth was spent in a place that was built and designed to house animals. And now, 33 years later, Jesus knows what's ahead of him, and he's spending time in the home of a friend. This love, no greater love, has any man than he would lay down his life for his friend. And here Jesus, this man of great love, who wants to love the whole world and demonstrate that love by coming and dying for them, Yet he's spending his time locked away with just a few close friends. Now, this week that we've rolled back to, that final week of Jesus' life, it's a week like no other week the earth has ever experienced. This week, the rocks are going to crack and break open. There will be dead people come up out of the ground and start walking around. The noon sun will be darkened and the sky will be as black as midnight. But all of the strange and the powerful things that frighten men aren't just happening on earth, but as we continue to go on, we know that Jesus, this same man who's quietly resting with his friends and having dinner with them this week, will take from Satan the keys to death, hell, and the grave. This is a disturbing week for humans. It's an incredible week, but yet more is accomplished for the benefit of mankind during this time than any other time in history. And yet the days leading up to it, even the hours leading up to it, Jesus is spending time with his friends. He's visiting with Lazarus, who he raised from the dead. He's having supper at the home of Simon. He's letting Martha and Mary attend to him and wait on him. And then right up toward the end of his life, he's going to invite his 12 closest apostles and they're going to go into a room and have supper together. He'll then invite them to go with him to a garden for prayer. And that's how he lives out this last week of his life. But what is it that causes Jesus to want to spend time with this secluded group? What is it about them that 
he wants to go to Lazarus' house and he wants to visit with Simon the leper and he wants to have supper with the twelve and he wants to go to prayer meeting with them. When this is the God who loved the whole world. He loved it enough to come and die for it, to save it. But yet he's not rushing around touching and seeing and visiting them all. He's, he's honed in on these few. What is it that causes him and moves him that attracts him to these I think it goes back to that definition of love. You and I usually define love as more or less an, emotion, an emotional response. We don't see love as something we initiate necessarily, but it's our response to a feeling. We see something we like, and in particular, we're talking about boys and girls, husbands and wives, and there's an attraction that begins, and then there's this emotional response to that, and that's how we define love. Sometimes we even go so far in our definition of love that it's almost as if you and I have no choice in what we love. Our emotions just get stirred up. Our attractions become strong. And that's just what we love. But here, Jesus deliberately demonstrated love. And in John 3, 16, He loved the world so much that He came to die for it. But yet... That week he spends his time with a few close friends. That definition of love, I think if we look at it again carefully, we'll realize that Jesus was not looking at love defined the way that we define it. But instead, he would define love as a selfless dedication to saving the lives of others. Now, I know that's a, an unusual definition and it's kind of a strong one a selfless dedication to saving the lives of others. But yet, if you stop and really analyze how Jesus lived and what He did, and if God is love and we see love acted out in the life of Jesus, He had a selfless dedication to saving the lives of others. And if we translate that into our world, into our actions, that's really what love would be with us as well. It's not an emotional response because we're commanded to love one another. We're commanded to love our neighbor as ourselves. Taking you back to Ephesians chapter 5, where it talks about the love between a husband and a wife, there's no emotion mentioned there. There's no strong feeling. There's no sexual attraction described. It's just simply a love, a commitment, a selfless devotion, a selfless dedication where one serves the other. We get it backwards. We wait to follow our feeling and define our feeling then as love. The truth is, our feelings will follow our actions in true love. In the love that Jesus displayed, the feeling follows the action. And in that chapter 5 of Ephesians where it talks about Husbands loving their wives and wives loving and serving their husbands. It's about love and it's about choices and it's about action. And so when we want to know how do we live out the life of love like Jesus displayed, again, Ephesians chapter 5 is the best example because it not only shows and describes and what that love is, the husbands love their wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself for it, but it also allows us to measure that love. I can measure my love for my wife not by my feeling, but by how close I come to what Paul wrote when he said that I should love my wife as Christ loved the church and gave himself for it. That's a measurable, a measurable amount of love or a way to measure whether I am loving my wife or not. And I know we got way off of for God so loved the world, to now talk about how I love my wife. But it's an illustration of the love that Jesus displayed. Because you see, none of us, you and me, are really that lovable when you get right down to it. Human beings are selfish. We're unkind. We are often belligerent. We, 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 we center our lives around what makes us feel good. And we follow our feelings. And so when you have this God who says He loves the world and wants to save the world, 
it can't really be an emotional connection that motivates him only. Because you and I are sinners. We're hateful. We're liars. We're thieves. We take advantage of one another. And there's nothing in us that would cause God to want to have us. Matter of fact, the prophet said that all of our righteousnesses are like filthy rags in his sight. So there's got to be a love that's deeper than just an emotional response. And that's what God displayed. When, again, reading from 1 Timothy chapter 3, 16, where God was manifest in the flesh, where He chose to come and live among human beings and demonstrate and show them what love is. And love is not just an emotional response, but it's a selfless dedication, a selfless commitment to another. And so God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son that whosoever believeth in Him should not perish but have everlasting life. And now in this last week of Jesus' life, He's just about to die on the cross for every man. And His sacrifice on Calvary and that resurrection that will follow is going to be just as, just as effective for the sinner who never worships Him as it will be for Lazarus, his friend, that he's staying in his home. And yet Jesus is not out rushing around trying to find everybody and touch every. He is at home with these friends. So why? How does love push him to spend time with these? The reason Jesus was spending time in the home of Lazarus and at the home of Simon the leper, and would have supper with the twelve, and would invite them to a prayer meeting, was because they too were not responding to him in an emotional way only. But they were following after him and making commitments that demonstrated a love to him. In other words, they were responding to Jesus' love by loving him back. And not just in emotional responses and not just based on how they felt, but as demonstrated by Mary and Martha, they both were serving Jesus. One of them working hard to provide the food. One was putting expensive ointment upon his feet and later upon his head. Those were actions not based on emotion, but actions based on a choice and a decision that I am going to serve this one. And why is all that important and why am I spending this valuable time on a Sunday talking to you about it? Well, the reason is, is because Jesus Christ died on the cross for all of us. And he was not motivated only by some emotional feeling that he couldn't resist. It was a well thought out, clearly decided measure that he took to die for your sins and for mine. But the difference now on how he responds to me and to you is based upon how we decide to demonstrate our love for him. You see, the reason that Jesus wound up in the last days of his life with just these close friends was because they were the ones who were following him. They were the ones who left their businesses and their homes to follow him. They were the ones who made not just an emotional response, but a clearly thought out decision that I am going to leave this and I am going to serve Him. And that brings you and me to this point today as we celebrate this coming weekend, the death of Jesus, Jesus Christ on Calvary for our sin. And then next Sunday, Easter, we will celebrate His resurrection that brought total victory to us and the power of God's Spirit to reside in us. As we celebrate this week and we contemplate all that Jesus did for us, Remember that He will choose to stay with us and to guide us and to help us based on how we respond in love toward Him. So this morning, you may not be feeling a strong emotional attachment that, you know, that just motivates you, I want to follow Jesus. But if you will make a deliberate decision, I will follow Him, and you do that, you will find that in the deep and darkest times of your life, he will be there for you. Because you see, he spent time at Lazarus' house and he spent time at Simon's house and he spent time with the 12. But if you read what he did and why he was there, 
in John chapter 12, 13, 14, 15 and, and on, you will realize that he was telling them, there are some things that are going to happen and I want you to be prepared. I want you to understand so that when it happens, your faith will not be destroyed and your trust will remain. You see, Jesus knows who responds to him in love. And when they respond to him in love, he will not leave them alone. He will not remove them from the dark days of troubled lives because he knew that when he was going to be tried and crucified, that his followers would also be accused. He knew that time was coming. And that's why these last few days he spent with them because they were the ones who had demonstrated by their actions that, Lord, we love you. And my call to you this Sunday is to realize that the God who loves you isn't a, a God who's just blindly, emotionally following after you because of whatever moves him as maybe our creator or as some heavenly parent. But instead, he has made a logical, realistic decision. Before you were born, from Romans chapter 5, but God commended his love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. He died for you, not out of an emotional decision, but a cold-blooded, wide-eyed, plain decision the Lord made to save you and to care for you and to demonstrate that by His love. And in return, if you and I will make the same commitment, if you and I will not just follow our feelings here and there and hot when our feelings are, are fervent and kind of cold when our feelings die a bit, but if we will decide, I am going to follow Jesus, I am going to live for Him, I'm going to love Him by serving Him, by putting Him ahead of me, by selflessly serving and dedicating my life to Him, I am going to follow Him. You will find that Jesus will prepare you for the days that lie ahead just as he did for his 12 and his friends Lazarus and Mary and Martha and his friend Simon the leper that he had cleansed, he will also make sure in the dark times of your life that he's there for you. Because you see, Jesus loves the whole world, but he responds to those who love him. I challenge you today as we finish this time of worship together that right there in your home with your family, Make a commitment that I'm not just going to follow Jesus in the high times of life. My faith isn't going to be based on how I feel. I'm not going to burn hot when my, my emotions are strong and when life brings discouragement, my faith and my love for God's going to wane and drop off. Make a commitment today. My love will match God's love for me. He selflessly served me. He dedicated his life for me. I who am unlovable, unkind, have no reason to attract the attention of God. Yet before I was born, Romans chapter 5 says, He died for me. And likewise, I now will live my life for Him. I encourage you today as we finish, make a commitment as we pray in your heart that, Lord, I will follow you. Wherever your word leads me, however life goes, I will be committed to your ways. I'll not seek my own above yours, but Lord, my life will be a life of love. I'll serve you. I'll commit my heart and my life to your ways. Would you make that your prayer with me as we finish today? Lord, we thank you for the wonderful privilege we have to enjoy your love, to know that our sins are forgiven, to know that you have blotted all of that out by the sacrifice that you on Calvary endured, and the blood that you shed for our sins. Lord, our hearts are filled often with our own pride, with our own self-importance. And the reality is that we are all just, just creatures, Lord, before you, that our righteousnesses, they don't pile up to amount to anything in your presence, just filthiness and uncleanness. And so, Lord, today I pray that you'll forgive us for having hearts that are full of pride and sometimes selfish, that you will cleanse our hearts 
And that as we face this week, Lord, of your, of your passion, this week of your, your death, your suffering, and your resurrection, may we anew today make a commitment to follow you in love and determine that we are not going to wander based only on our, our emotions and our love will not be an emotional response to you, but it will be a heartfelt commitment, Lord, to put ourselves after serving you. I pray for everyone who's hearing this, Lord, for our families. I pray that you'll touch them. Those who have spent this time away from the presence of God, I pray you'll draw them close and forgive them, Lord, of their sins and let them feel the nearness of your presence. Let your blessing be upon all of us, I pray. Guide us, keep us, and let your work be done through us as we return the love that you have demonstrated toward us. In Jesus' name we pray and give you all the thanks. Amen, amen. I encourage you to continue to worship. Let the presence of the Lord continue to fill your lives. And together, let's be that church that God has desired us to be. And let's love Him with a pure heart. Hi.